cliche, uh, but at the same time, it is very real. Uh, the next generation uh, carries the future. You need to know the world we live in, uh, and you will make movements as, as we older people uh, move on. So with all that uh, said, let me, my, my real pleasure to introduce Michael Clare. Well, so hello, everybody. <laughs> I think we're in a very um, strange and difficult time, and I'm not sure that I know exactly what's going on. I don't think anybody can, but I think we are in a moment of transition. We're moving into a new world. It is dangerous. The world's always dangerous, but it's dangerous in new ways. That's what I want to talk about tonight. And I'll talk for a while, but I really want to have it be a conversation, because I don't know all the answers, and I want to hear from you folks as well what you have to say to this. So um, my topic tonight is a new Cold War, question mark, geopolitical competition between the US, China, and Russia. Now, uh, you notice that the first part of this, a new Cold War, has a question mark after it. Originally, I was asked to speak on the topic, the new Cold War. And I thought about that. And I reflected on it, and I have some doubts about that categorization. We can discuss that. Um, so I decided to add a question mark. And then I thought about it some more, and I decided that the question mark invites something else. And so I added geopolitical competition between the US, China, and Russia. And that's kind of what I'm, I'm going to talk about. Um, so before I go any further, let me remove any aura of suspense. Um, I do not think we are now in or about to enter soon a new Cold War akin to the Cold War of the 1950s through the 1960s. I do think we're headed into a new era of great power geopolitical competition akin to that uh, from the years leading up to World War I, the Great War, whose 100th anniversary we're commemorating now. Of course, we tend to forget about World War I because World War II was so much worse. Uh, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of people are thinking more about World War I now that it's the 100th anniversary and recalling that that war uh, at, at its time was utterly catastrophic. Uh, tens of millions of people perished. Cities were destroyed. Um, they didn't have nuclear weapons then, but they had weapons of near mass destruction. And uh, empires fell, and uh, civilians were, were devastated. Young men from all the countries, whole generation were wiped out. So it's worth thinking about World War I. These two paradigms, uh, the pre-World War I era and the Cold War era have their differences, and I, I, I will explain. But I want to emphasize that they're equally dangerous in their, each in their own way. Uh, so that even if we don't face, and as I'll argue, the same dangers as in the Cold War period, it doesn't mean we're out of the woods, that we're, we're free of danger. The period before World War I was equally dangerous. And that's what I will try to talk about tonight. So here's, what I'm, here's my, my presentation, make four, four topics I'm going to cover. Why I don't think we're seeing a new Cold War, that is to say, akin to the one of the 50s and 60s. Why I do think we're in a new era of geopolitical competition. Why I think this new era of geopolitical competition is exceedingly dangerous. And what, what, offer some thoughts about what, how to address this new era that we're in. OK, why do I not think we're in a replica of the original Cold War? Well, first of all, I, I, I remember the Cold War. Some of you, you in this room do as well. Uh, I was a schoolboy in New York City, in the Bronx, in elementary school, and then in high school in Manhattan. And we all had to uh, go through regular drills of hiding under the desk, our desk, 
and there were drills when we all had to go into the basement of our building because of the possibility of a nuclear attack. That was the law. We were required to do that. And at the same time, there would be uh, pictures in Life magazine. We all knew that, that ground zero was Times Square. And I was at, in high school and, in, and then in Columbia about um, you know, 50, 60 blocks from Times Square. We all knew that we would be annihilated. And everybody we knew would be annihilated. And going under our desk wasn't going to kill us. It wasn't going to save us, I should say. So the Cold War was, was vivid in my experience. I remember the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. I was a student at Columbia when, peop when we really thought uh, nuclear weapons were going to strike and we would be wiped out. So uh, we, 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 I, I lived through my childhood, as many of you here may remember, thinking that nuclear war was very real and was going to happen. And we would all perish. And that was the time also when the US and the Soviet Union faced each other across the Iron Curtain in Europe. And there were other boundaries in the Middle East and Asia with forces lined up on either side, ready to go at a moment's notice into full-scale war, which we knew would escalate into a nuclear attack uh, very quickly, and that the level of slaughter would be immense. I had an opportunity in 1982 as a reporter from Mother Jones magazine to participate in a military exercise on the German, East German, West German border and saw US preparations for a full-scale war with the Warsaw Pact. And we saw where the nuclear, uh, tactical nuclear weapons were stored 50 miles from the border. And and, and the guys, the, the soldiers said, you know, why are, we, why are we wasting our time with this when we knew that the, within hours of the beginning of the war it would become nuclear? Besides that, in that period, there were virtually no contact across the borders between ordinary people. There was no trade, no student exchanges, nothing but mutual suspicion and hostility. That was what the world was like. This is not the situation we face today. Really, it's not. Although the US, China, and Russia have significant differences and are supporting opposite sides in a number of local conflicts, we don't have forces lined up at this time, thank gods, ready at a moment's notice to engage in war with a very high likelihood of nuclear escalation. I'm not saying that that couldn't happen in the future, but I don't, I don't feel that that's imminent. I don't think it's the same sort of thing. Moreover, there's considerable trade and contact between the US, Russia, and China. A lot of students travel back and forth and take classes there. There are corporate joint ventures and a variety of other cooperative endeavors. The Cold War period was also a period of, there was a kind of stability to it. It was a freaky stability, mutual assured destruction was, was not, a, not the sort of way you want to keep things stable. But there was, there was a degree of stability because both sides understood that any provocation, especially after the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, that any wildly provocative behavior uh, would instantly trigger a, a explosive escalatory uh, event that could lead very quickly to a nuclear exchange. So it, it, it was kind of static. Each side was aware of the risks of miscalculation. But I, I don't think that's the situation we're in today. And, and I don't think that's, that's the world we're likely to face in the future. Rather, I think we're in a, a different kind of world. It's a world in which there are not two, but three polars, poles, of contending strength, the US, China, and Russia, as well as an assortment of lesser powers, uh, also vying for regional influence 
India, Turkey, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, among others, all jostling for advantage, for geopolitical advantage in the world. And it's a very fluid world. It's not the static world of the Cold War period. It's a very different kind of structure, architecture of world relations. The United States remains the most powerful of these poles, of these centers of contending influence and competition, but not so much more powerful that it can intimidate any of the others or any combination of the others. The United States is also uh, exhausted by two wars in the Middle East, and there's very little uh, enthusiasm among the public, despite what you hear from candidates, for engaging in another major war anywhere in the world. So there's a degree of reticence and, and uh, uh, a desire not to get ex excessively involved in more foreign military adventures. Nonetheless, it's the only power still that is able to project power everywhere in the world, on every continent. No other country is in a capacity to do that. But we have two other powers, Russia and China, that seek to extend their influence way beyond their borders into other regions of the world. Uh, Russia and the Middle East, especially, we see that now. Uh, China and Central Asia and Southeast Asia and other areas. And whereas the United States is sort of reeling from its uh, misadventures in the Middle East, uh, Russia and China are feeling more contentious. Uh, Russia, a former superpower, a former empire, um, feels that it has been abused by the post-Cold War era and seeks to reassert what it sees as its historic right to play a role way beyond its borders as a great power to extend its influence beyond its borders and is testing uh, the United States and other powers in see how far it could go in that direction. China was once a great empire and a great power. It was humiliated and humbled by the colonial powers in the 18th and 19th centuries. Now. China feels it's, it's time to restore itself to a great power uh, with uh, supreme influence in its region and to extend its influence beyond. Both of these countries uh, feel that the United States has uh, been weakened by its, its adventures overseas and that it's, time, it's a good time for them to test uh, there to see how much further they can extend their influence. And there are other powers not quite as um, ambitious, but, but uh, powers that seek greater influence in their own region, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, uh, among others, India now, uh, also seeking to extend their influence beyond their territories. So this, this is the world we live in today. It's a very fluid world. It's a very contested world. All these countries are vying for advantage, um, for influence, for control over resources, over significant geographic features um, in the areas surrounding them in, and in many overlapping areas of contention, Central Asia, uh, the Middle East. The, um, the Pacific area. All these areas have multiple powers contending for influence. And all of these poles of power um, are pursuing their own interests independently, sometimes in alignment with others, sometimes not. Sometimes China and Russia cooperate uh, against the United States. Uh, in Central Asia, they, they, they are united in trying to keep the United States out of the area, but they themselves are competing for influence in that area. So at this stage, in this fluid world environment that we're in, 
I don't see any likelihood that any of these countries that I've named will take deliberate action that would lead to a head-on clash with any of the others. That they're not going to, I don't see them, they're going to instigate a war with any other major player. However, and this is the scary part, they all seek to gain influence and advantage in contested borderlands between them, in the contested areas in the world. They're seeking advantage by intervening in these contested zones, Syria, Ukraine, Yemen, Libya, Afghanistan, where two or more of these actors all contending for influence and power. They're all intervening, providing weapons, uh, sending advisors, in some cases sending covert forces. They are all using these countries as chess, these, these contested zones as chessboards uh, to try to extend their influence and power. Syria being the most um, obvious example where you have Turkey seeking advantage, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Russia, the United States, among others, uh, all seeking to affect the outcome and extend their influence. Now, before I go any further about this, um, um, I, I want to say that I find this incredibly cruel and immoral because one consequence of this is that multiple powers pouring in weapons and advisors and the like ensures that the level of slaughter in these small wars is incredibly great. What's happening in Syria is one of the great crimes of any time in history, maybe not on the scale of World War I or World War II, but close to that in magnitude. It is a crime of incredible magnitude, and it's because all of these outside powers are using it as a chessboard to move pawns around. And this is what we're going to see more and more of, I believe. That's bad enough. Uh, but also, all of, the, all of these powers are, are, are testing each other, how far they can get, how far can they go uh, before they provoke some kind of extreme action. They're all seeking to demonstrate their virility, their vigor, um, and to test the resolve and steadfastness of their rivals. And these words, virility, steadfastness, resolve, are psychological words. And I chose them, even gendered words. And, and I think this is an accurate uh, reflection of, of what we, we're seeing. It's uh, a very, uh, if you'll forgive me saying, a masculine kind of a game uh, akin to bullies on a school playground, you know, seeing who's tougher by, by taunting and pushing and shoving and seeing if they'll get a reaction. That's what we're seeing in the world today. Um, this, is, this is very much the backdrop to our election now. Uh, you'll, because, uh, you know, what the Republicans are saying is we're being pushed around. That's, that's their common theme, and that we have to push back. It's time to push back. Uh, so that's the kind of world we are. And, and the way this, this, this is being played out is in military action short of war, military exercises, uh, feints, uh, gunboat diplomacy. We don't hear about it a lot, but it's going on all the time, it's speeding up, and it's exceedingly dangerous. What do I mean by this? Russia, for example, is reported to be sending its nuclear-capable bombers. I use nuclear-capable, meaning they, take, they can carry nuclear weapons. You don't know if they have nuclear weapons. But they're sending their nuclear weapons into NATO airspace on a regular basis, forcing NATO forces to scramble their jets to chase them out. This is happening almost daily. Um, uh, all, they've also sent submarines into the territory of NATO countries and Sweden, uh, forcing them to respond in a similar way. And I don't have to talk about Russian involvement in Ukraine. United States, as for its part, 
is uh, expanding, and Duncan spoke about this earlier, is building up its military capabilities in Eastern Europe, including the territory of the former Soviet Union, is talking about more military exercises in Eastern Europe on the borders of Russia, uh, planning more exercises a year ahead. Uh, the budget for Eastern Europe activities by the US military is going to increase next year fourfold from $800 million to $3.5 billion. Um, I don't know if you're aware, um, on Monday, Russia announced it's going to hold uh, what they call SNAP military exercises in southern and western Russia, uh, mobilizing its forces, all of its forces, for full-scale war preparation and presumably for exercises. Um, uh, there's some speculation that this is a prelude to greater Russian involvement in e Ukraine. Others say it's a prelude to a tougher stance towards Turkey. Um, Turkey shot down a Russian airplane. That's another example I was going to mention. So we're on the verge of this. Looking at the Pacific, uh, China has declared an air defense identification zone it's called, over contested islands in the East China Sea, saying that they have control over space, claimed also by Japan. And uh, Japan has sent its uh, forces into this, its planes into that airspace. And the United States sent a nuclear-capable B-52 bombers regularly into this Chinese airspace, just to show we still have the muscle to threaten you. Uh, China is building up its uh, claimed, claimed t uh, islands in the South China Sea, militarizing them in violation of um, uh, claims by the other countries in the region that that's, that's not their territory. Uh, the U.S. is sending uh, missile-armed destroyers, I don't know if they're nuclear-armed or not, uh, within a few miles of these islands. Just a week ago this happened again. This is exceedingly dangerous kinds of behavior. And there's a lot more other examples. Uh, Turkey shot down a plane, a Russian plane. It looks like Russia is now, the next time that happens, and there, were other, there have been other near incidents on the Syrian-Turkish border, um, it looks like Russia is preparing uh, for more uh, military response. North Korea fired an intercontinental missile. They claimed it was to put a satellite in space. These are all the kinds of testing that I'm talking about. These are not acts of war per se. Uh, they're all what, what you might call opening gambits in a, 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 uh, a global chessboard with all these players um, contending for influence and position on the global chessboard. And the tempo, as I say, and the frequency of these events appears to be increasing. Uh, now, this has me very worried, and it should have all of us worried. First of all, because of the obvious risk of miscalculation and unintended consequences. Think how easy it would be for a panicky 20-something-year-old Chinese airmen, these are all men, airmen, to fire on a B-52 bomber in Chinese airspace in their air defense zone. We send B-52 bombers into Chinese airspace, and, and they send up their planes, and, and a 20-something and a pilot in a fighter plane is told to intercept that and, and thinks that the U.S. plane is threatening and to fire on it and shoot it down. We're just a hair breadth away from something like that happening. Um, or if a panicky French or, or American or British pilot uh, sees a Russian uh, bo bomber entering, c c they, they come right up to the coast of the UK, right into their uh, offshore, these, these nuclear capable bombers, a panicky 20 year old has the same reaction. We're a hairbreadth away from that. 
And these are happening every day. How many near misses is it going to take before something goes too far and provokes a major incident? Now, if that were to happen tomorrow, I, I have pretty reasonable confidence that President Obama will get on the phone and talk to P President Putin or President Xi Jinping, and they'll work it out. I really do, um, rather than start World War III. That's why I have some confidence. But how confident can we be that this will be case, the case in five or 10 years from now? That I'm not so sure, especially if these incidents keep multiplying and the political environment worsens. Now, I, I know there are a lot of reasons to be concerned about the coming presidential election. I don't have to tell you that, right? But this is what worries, the most, worries me the most. What if it's a President Trump or a President uh, uh, Cruz or Rubio or even, for that matter, Hillary Clinton. We could talk about this. Who's president in four or five years and a Chinese fighter pilot in panic shoots down or fires a missile at a B-52 bomber in Chinese-claimed airspace? That's what worries me in, 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 after a period of these kinds of incidents. Uh, that they're, my fear is that they're going to feel obliged <coughs> This is what the Republicans say every single day, if you listen to their language, that President Obama hasn't been tough enough, he hasn't been manly enough. You know, uh, he hasn't, hasn't enough spine. We have to stand up to the bastards and respond in, in, in kind and then some and show them who's boss. This is the essence of Trump's argument. So what are they going to do when they're in this position? That's what worries me. Now, we've seen a period like this once before. In the late, late 1800s and early 1900s, when you also had four or five great powers contending for power and influence all over the world, in Africa, in the Middle East, in the Pacific, in the Balkans, all over um, Europe, <coughs> all jostling for advantage, geopolitical uh, strategic advantage, uh, shifting alliances, and where you had smaller powers getting, uh, you know, trying to uh, play these against each other, seek advantage of their own, Serbia, Italy, the Ottoman Empire. These powers, uh, like today, the powers were all intervened in these local conflicts, especially in the Balkans. The British were involved, the Germans were involved, the Austrians were involved, the Russians were involved, fighting over uh, bits of territory. These encounters were not by themselves decisive, but they created a aura of hostility and suspicion and fear uh, that led to the point where, where just one incident was sufficient to lead to a train of events that led to war. The one that happened was Sarajevo in 1914. That was 102 years ago. I don't think we're in 1914 today, but I do think we're in 1904. And if you look at the history of that period, you will see that there were a series of incidents like we're seeing today of exactly this kind. Small incidents, encounters, um, that uh, led each one, multi made, uh, made the powers more and more fearful and suspicious of the next. So that's why I think we're in a new era of geopolitical competition and rivalry rather than a new Cold War. Uh, but before I, I um, finish, uh, you know, I feel I should say a few words about, you know, what, what, how do we respond to this world? This is the world we live in. And it's the world we're going to be living in. And I don't see any exit from this world of multiple contending powers all intervening in small local wars and <clears throat> testing each other. Um, what are we, uh, with the risk that one could escalate into something worse. So 
um, what do we do? Uh, it seems to me that one thing we should try very hard is to combat the uh, inclination to engage in muscle flexing and uh, try to find all the ways to stop everything uh, that has this risk of w w where some panicky 20-year-old is going to pull a trigger and start a war. So no B-52s in Chinese airspace, no American missile destroyers in Chinese uh, claimed territories, for example, no positioning of American forces on Russian territory, none of that kind of provocative behavior that's uh, so risky and provocative. Now, that's not going to stop Russia and China from engaging in such behavior. So we have to find strategies to, to persuade that without, going, without, in, without engaging in, in tit-for-tat behavior, what do you do? So we have to find uh, economic means and political means and diplomatic means to work with those countries um, e even while we uh, decry what they're doing, and we should, what Russia is doing is despicable, I believe, and we should let that be known, but uh, work with them to find ways to uh, discourage them from engaging in provocative behavior. And that's going to involve some kind of quid pro quo on things, and that's going to be hard. And I'm not saying I know the answer to this, but that's the direction we have to move in, it seems to me. I think there should be trilateral summits. We had summits during the Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. We need U.S., Russian, Chinese summits to look at these conflict areas and to see how in all of our interests they can be de-escalated and resolved. And what has to be done, uh, what kind of quid pro quos on all sides are there that would bring down the tensions and eliminate the risk of unintended escalation. That's what we have to worry about, unintended escalation. At the same time, I, I think that we have to think strategically about um, how to avoid the kinds of behavior that will, because the United States is the most powerful of these countries and the, and the one that the others are testing themselves against, we have to be mindful of not doing things that's going to incline other powers to, to align together against us. And as an example I will give briefly um, is the pivot to, the so-called pivot to the Pacific that the Obama administration and Hillary Clinton in particular has supported. That, that, that they now call it rebalancing to the Pacific, less, less threatening. They claim this has nothing to do with China. It has everything to do with China. <laughs> it is intended to constrain the rise of China. Building new bases in Australia, now going back to building bases in the Philippines after we were thrown out of the Philippines, uh, providing ar arms and uh, aligning with Vietnam against China, uh, building ties with Burma and Mongolia, all in an effort to, in Indonesia, to constrain China's rise. Not only is this uh, turning the entire Chinese population against the United States, uh, but also pushing China to move closer to Russia. And they are moving closer in strategic terms. Uh, China buying more Russian weapons, buying more energy from Russia. This is the worst thing you would want to do, is to uh, create anti-American alliances. It's a, a madness. So um, avoid behavior that's going to uh, unite other poles, other powers against the United States in a military fashion. There's, well, there's, there's more to say about this, and, and we have to think creatively. Um, think back, 
imagine this is 1904, and we, can, we know what happened between 1904 and 1914. All the mistakes, there were turning points in that road that could have been avoided. That's the way we have to think strategically today. What could be done to prevent th that kind of escalation of events that led to World War I? That's, what, that's the way we have to think today. How to reduce this geopolitical competition, the muscle flexing, and reduce the unintended risk of unintended escalation that would lead to a real war. And that's, that, I think, is the task of today. And I'll stop with that. Um, I'm very, very eager to hear what uh, you folks think about what I said. If you, I, I welcome disagreement as much as anything else, uh, and also thoughts about where this might lead. So I'll, I'll finish there. I, I promised Joe that be, 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 to have the first crack at me. Okay, well, I don't want to do a crack, man. Just yeah. to say that I work very closely you know, with, with the Japanese peace movement. Uh, and just to appreciate, in terms of wild cards out there, uh, the Japanese government and their prime minister is actually the grandson of a Class A war criminal who's doing his best to turn the clock back uh, to uh, uh, the pre war period and moving very hard and quickly to. Remote, we have further remilitarized Japan, changed the Constitution. Yeah. And just to say that the vision of the Constitution that they have is chilling. Mm. It's absolutely chilling. Uh, and they were the ones who provoked the crisis with China over the Senkaku Dayu Islands and kind of opened that period. So be aware of that. I guess the question I have is thinking in terms of how we, we go forward. And I, I, I very much agree with your analysis. I, I wonder if you see the, the frame of common security. Uh, I think we need to have a positive alternative vision yeah. to move toward, people toward. And we, we need a framework that gives people uh, an idea that it could be better an alternative to this. I, I wonder if, if the uh, concept of common security that was developed at the end of the Cold War and helped to end it is something you think might be, might be useful at this stage. What, what do you mean by that? Well, my, my understanding, and growing out of the Palme Commission, uh, was the idea that, okay, you've got these contending powers and forces, uh, that in the process of the military buildups and, and testing, uh, you're actually inciting fear on the other side, which leads them to increase their military, and you spiral up. My understanding of the diplomacy that took place then that led to the uh, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement is that in those negotiations, each side named their fear. Uh, each side uh, then attempted to negotiate a way that reduced that fear in a way that didn't ultimately weaken them. And you move toward a common security arrangement. You recognize that I can't, our side is not going to feel secure if your side feels insecure. It's a basis for hard-headed negotiations, not for you know, easy, easy yes. kind of uh, yeah. you're, you're stuff. You're bringing that back to me. Joe, I appreciate uh, your thought that we have to find you know, a positive framework. I don't think that'll work because this is not being driven by fear of mutual, mutual annihilation. This is being driven by a competitive struggle for power and influence by countries that feel that uh, the world is uh, more ripe for exploitation and predation. And. Uh, you know, what, what, what the Republicans are saying is we should re reintroduce fear into the equation, which I don't, you know, I don't find that a very comforting idea. So how, how, do, you, how do you deal with, with this new world? I, 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 I think, um, you know, find, finding a, a, human, a, 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 as I say, the, victim, the victims of this is not Russia or China or the United States. It's the people of the chessboard countries, Syria, Yemen, Libya, uh, Afghanistan, uh, that are, are being, being treated as, as, as people to be slaughtered in the name of this competition. And, and somehow it's, it's a humanitarian impulse to, to save the innocent that maybe has to be uh, given more highlight. 
I think what's happening in Syria is just criminal, and 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 you know, words escape me. All right, I'll take I'll take other questions. One, two, three, and then I'll get everybody else. The, 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 at the level of countries, this is not being expressed so much as the U.S. versus China, the U.S versus Russia, but it's being played out in other battlefields where it's local groups, uh, local communities that are struggling, and they are being victimized, they are being taken over uh, by the great powers as tools, as pawns, you know, literally as pawns in this larger geopolitical struggle. So it, it, it is local people who are the victims of this process, as was the case. You know, what started World War I was the attempt of the great powers to take, you know, to dominate what was happening in the Balkans, where you had a lot of local different uh, ethnic groups on the ground struggling with one another. In, in my comments, I said very clearly that the U.S. was remain the most powerful country, and it's the only one that has a global presence. I said that very clearly. Yeah. Um, I also think that it is, as you say, a hegemon in decline. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think the United States was ever a supremely dominant everywhere. There were always, uh, op there was always centers of opposition. And it's so important to remember that because our leaders seem to think it's, it's hubris we have to worry about, the arrogance, the belief that we can send our forces and prevail. That's the curse of, so let me, let me, let me finish. Um, uh, so uh, yes, uh, what's, we, what's dangerous, whether, it, this is not about right or wrong. What's dangerous, history tells us, is moments like this when you have a declining hegemon and you have other powers seeking to push back and test that, and the declining hegemon is reluctant to abandon its historic dominance, that's when you have the risk of multiple wars arising. That's all I'm saying. I'm not trying to say one is the cause of it. It's the situation we're in that makes this so dangerous. And that's not with what, uh, you know, the young people who are going to be around in the future are going to have to deal with the fact that China is a rising power, is testing us, and is pushing back, and, and that American leaders are going to have to figure out how to uh, accommodate to this reality. And Russia is pushing back, and we have to accommodate to that reality in a, non, in, in a non-provocative way. That's all I'm saying. Otherwise, we're doomed. To what degree does ideology play a role in this geopolitical competition? Well, in, in China, um, I, I don't know how much you would call it a, an ideology, but there is certainly a belief uh, that China's time has come, that China is entitled to, um, to plant its, that's not the right, that, that, that China's time has come to be treated as one of the great powers of the world, that it's entitled to be treated in a new fashion as a great power, and that it, it is a great power, um, not, just a, not just on Chinese territory, but to, to extend its influence beyond its territory. So whether that's uh, you know, a greater China or a great China, now, I, I don't know if you call that an ideology, but it is uh, a, a certainly something that is widely shared, not just among the leadership, but among the Chinese pop That's what people told me anyway. Uh, so the, the sense of, 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 of China's destiny to play, that they're the new superpower of the future. And, and that, that, I think, has a, a real consequences. Um, um, I, I know that the last time, or one of the times the Secretary of Defense was in Beijing, met with his counterpart uh, to talk about this. Uh, his counterpart, whose name I can't remember, uh, said, uh, this is all well and good, but those islands are ours and we'll use any means necessary, including military force, to take them over. So I, I don't know, that what the, you know how effective they are because these are political decisions. 
And the, all, all of these actions are political gambits. And as I say, you know, we're in a, we're in a period of testing and we now have a presidential election where, where this is, this is, a, this is a, a main theme where, where the Republicans are trying to outdo each other and how tough they're gonna be in response to these gambits. So it's, it's at the political level that I worry, much less than the military. I think, Russia, I, I, I think Russia has a kind of ideology that we are a great power that has been a great power throughout history, um, that we were denied our rightful place in the world um, hierarchy of nations by the vindictive Americans after the end of the Cold War. Um, and we've been mistreated, and therefore uh, we're, going, we're going to restore our rightful place. This is, this is Putinism. I think that's kind of ideological. But it's not ideological in the, the, the sense it rests on communism or socialism or anything like that. That's the best I think I could do. Fix your question. <laughs> You're all fit where the Sunni-Shia divide. And uh, Saudi Arabia is supporting uh, Sunni forces in, in, in Syria, in Yemen, in other countries. Iran, a Shia state, is supporting Shia forces in Hezbollah and in Syria, Assad. Uh, Russia is aligned with the Shia. Um, uh, China's uh, Uyghurs, I believe they're Sunnis, they're moderate Sunnis. Um, and the Sunnis, in, there, there are more uh, uh, Islamic uh, uh, fundamentalism and jihadism taking root in Russia. So yes, this is an area of possible collaboration. There was some of that after 9-11, and then it sort of dissipated. So, so I see that. Um, I've seen, I've seen references to what you're talking about in the, in the media here and there, so it's a very interesting question. There is a resource dimension to this uh, in that, um, in, in that uh, Ir Iran has the largest natural gas reserves in the world and, uh, China, and Russia has the second biggest and there's talk of them collaborating. Um, using Syria as a through point to export. Uh, so um, there's, there's that. So, you know, there is these conspiracy theories about a U.S.-Saudi alliance against that Russia-Syria-Iranian alliance. So that's, I have to think more about it. Do you, I, think, I think the U.S. created ISIS through the militarization of Iraq, the arrest of all of the, the, the um, dismemberment of the Ba'ath Party, the dismemberment of the Iraqi army, uh, which put all of these uh, uh, Sunnis out of work um, uh, in the military, became very disgruntled and resisted, thrown in Abu Ghraib and were tortured and became radicalized in American prisons. That's the birthplace of ISIS. Mm. So they are a product of American intervention in Iraq. They're not American proxies. I don't worry about ISIS. I do worry about the Taliban, the Pakistan Taliban, because there you have a nuclear armed country, Pakistan. You have people in the military who are sympathetic to the Taliban. You have an unstable, political situation in Pakistan. You have the potential of state collapse. I think there's a real possibility of that because of climate change, among other, an economic collapse. And there I could see elements of the military collaborating with Taliban. And that, that, that worries me. And, um, you know, something has changed in the world. Um, when I wrote my book, Blood and Oil, um, I pictured a world, as did most other analysts at the time, that by now we would be running out of oil. And that's not what's happened. Instead, we're sinking in oil, we're drowning in oil. Um, there's too much oil in the world. And, 
the, the consequences of that are momentous. Uh, so one, one um, claim in the Russian media is uh, that the U.S. and the Saudis, this alliance that we heard about, the U.S. and the Saudis are conspiring to lower the oil price to drive Russia into bankruptcy. Uh, Thomas Friedman said that in the New York Times, too. Um, so, so now there's the, you know, the possibility that uh, we're using overabundance as a weapon rather than fighting over scarcity. Um, uh, I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure what else to say. Uh, Syria is not important for resources. It is important in a World War I-ish kind of way in location, 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 location. It is the center, you know, it borders Turkey, it borders Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, uh, um, Jordan, all these countries, and its uh, pipelines w would go through it. The, the uh, Iraqis and the Iranians want to build pipelines through, so whoever controls Syria in the end will be in a geographically, geopolitically important area, but it itself doesn't have a lot of resources. Uh, Central Asia has a lot of resources and there's an intense competition going on between Russia and China and Turkey and India for control of the natural gas and oil of Central Asia. Mongolia is intense competition between Russia and China. I, as I say, they're not, they're not always collaborating. So, um, and Mongolia, they both want control Mongolia. This kind of geopolitical struggle is, is the anti, the, the reverse of cooperation on climate change. So we will not solve climate, I'll say it, we will not solve climate change if the geopolitical competition worsens. They're, they're polar opposites of each other because you must have Russian, Chinese, American, Indian, cooperation to solve climate change. And if, if we're not talking to each other, then we will not solve climate change. So all these other efforts will be moot. That's what you have to tell them. So um, working with Chinese and Russian counterparts uh, on the behalf of climate change, but as a, you know, on, on demilitarization in order to solve climate change. That's the way, that's the way to do it. Africa and Asia and the Middle East. Well, okay, but that's <laughs> continental. Continental. Can, can you be specific as to other countries where they're more likely than not? Well, there are a lot. There are a lot of small and weak countries, um, and I, you know, all over Africa where where this is happening before our eyes. So, are you asking me where? Where will, where will climate catastrophe provoke something bigger? Yes. Well, Syria, Syria is an example of that, of course. Afghanistan is a case, I believe. Uh, uh, Yemen, for sure. Yemen is running out of water, uh, and, and, and uh, there's a lot of drought. Um, Iraq is another place where, that's, where drought is a serious problem. Something that I worry about is uh, competition between China and India over water because the main rivers of both China and India originate in the Himalayas. And uh, China has said we may divert all those rivers to China to satisfy our water needs before they go to India. And India said that that would be a, a cause of war. No, the big, the, the, the big belief there was, the, the, the big belief then there was a famous book. Do you know the title? That war was impossible because of the degree of integration between France, Germany, Britain, and Russia. What was it called? Uh, uh, the War of the Wars? Yeah. But there, there, there was a, but there was, no, no, there was a book that was produced around 1905 or 1910 by an economist who said we're so totally integrated that war is impossible, and many people believe that. So no, I don't, I, I, because, now, like, the way, the reason why I think it is similar is that, as distinct from the Cold War, during the Cold War we thought that war was a real 
option, a real likelihood. Um, I don't think people think that war between the great powers today is something you they would choose. Instead, they're engaging in skirmishing, testing, probing, exercises, and it's it's the unintended risk of unintended escalation that could come out of it. That's that was happened then. It was very similar to that period in that respect. No, 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 that's not going to, that's not stopping them from, them or us from sending warships in a near collision course in places. No, that's not what's holding us back. Yes, the bases matter. Uh, it's, it's the positioning of bases and the, the positioning of bases and the role that they play in this competition that matters. So the U.S. has lots of bases in Asia, but when the U.S. has acquired new bases in the Pacific, one in Australia, and now they're going back to Subic Bay in the Philippines, and I remember very well, because um, there were so many activists back then who were opposed to the, that was the biggest American base in the world, Subic Bay. The Filipino population rose up against it. Now we're going back to Subic Bay. Those are signals of intent aimed at China. They're statements of, to China, we're going to push back against you. So they have this, this symbolic, like I say, this, 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 we're, we're going we're to shove it to you, you know, a little bit. Um, Russia has... Um, uh, is building up its bases in Syria, and uh, and and it, this is they are clearly uh, creating. They now have, they have two bases in in Syria, and they are they are they are expanding them. And the, the, the implied threat here is that if there is some kind of effort to create a no-fly zone or something like that to protect the civilians, Russia is going to sabotage that. It has. It's successfully sabotaged that effort, whether you think that's a good idea or not. Um, chi uh, China has in the process of acquiring its first base in Africa. And this strikes me as a very, it's not a big military base. It's not militarily, they're not militarily significant. They're politically, geopolitically significant. So bases matter. It is a complicated world. And that America remains powerful, but now there are other countries that also have power and are contending with us. China has a lot of military industrial complex too. So does Russia. And they are building up their strength in relation to the United States. And that makes the situation so dangerous. So I agree with some of what you say. But, uh, Thank you very much for uh, yeah, being thank here. You. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much.